Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about um, Oracle versus Google, and I'm assuming you've heard of it because you're here. Um, just to let you know a little bit about myself, I'm, uh, my name is James Sanders. I'm an attorney in private practice. I'm a technology attorney um, here in Atlanta. And with me up here is Meredith Rose, who's with Public Knowledge. Um, and so what I thought we'd do is um, start this off by just sort of running through the, the anatomy of the case a little bit, tell you a little bit about it, and find out where we are, and then we can uh, talk about maybe where things uh, may go or uh, any questions you guys may have. But I want to make it very clear, feel free to interrupt at any time and take us on whatever tangents you guys want to take us on. We certainly want to um, make this as informative as possible. And uh, there's obviously a lot going on in this in this case, a lot of uh, a lot of crazy stuff back and forth. So, um, you know, without further ado, um, let's just go through the timeline uh, just to give you guys a flavor as to what's what's happened so far. So, uh, as you may know, in '96, um, Sun releases Java, and Android is founded in 2003. 2005, Android's acquired by Google as part of Google's decision to make a play into the mobile space, and then. 2005 is when Google began discussing with Sun about possibly licensing Java for uh, a partnership. Uh, those fell through, those negotiations fell through, and then in 2007, Google went ahead and released uh, Android for mobile. In 2010, Oracle acquired Sun, and then not too long after that, uh, Oracle and Google had done a little bit of negotiating about possibly licensing Java, but those also fell through. So then in 2010, Oracle decides they want to make some money in the mobile space, and they file suit in the Northern District of California against Google for a lot of different things, and we'll talk about those. So 2012, the Northern District of California decides that, uh, well, they have a trial. The jury finds Google infringes, but the trial court finds that the material that Google infringed was not copyrightable, which made Google ang uh, made Oracle angry, sorry. And then Oracle decides they're going to take it up to the federal circuit, and we'll talk about why it went to the federal circuit maybe a little later. They take it to the federal circuit. The federal circuit reverses the district court on the issue of copyrightability, and then they remand for a trial on fair use. In the meantime, Google decides they're going to try to take this up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decides they don't want to take the case, so they deny cert. Goes back down to the district court for uh, the round two trial on fair use, which was over the, s uh, actually in May. And there the jury finds that the use that was infringing was actually a fair use. So they find for Google, not over yet. Oracle is now appealing and is looking for a new trial for various reasons. So. I thought we'd talk a little bit about, you know, why why is this um, why is this interesting? And I think one of the things is this wouldn't be a big deal if it weren't for the fact that Java is uh, a fairly widespread uh, language. And is, this is uh, from the uh, IEEE uh, survey this year. And in terms of um, programming languages, as you, as you can see, Java is pretty popular, and certainly that's due to the net and and mobile as well. <coughs> And so what were Oracle's claims originally against, against Google? Well, they brought, they brought two different types of claims. They brought copyright claims, and they brought some patent claims, but the jury found there was no patent infringement. So we're really just talking about copyright stuff. So we're not talking about patent. There were no trade secret claims brought, and the reason for that, of course, is because, you know, Java's pretty much available to the public, so there's no issues of secrecy, et cetera. So what about Oracle's copyright claims? So here's where it starts to get a little, in a little interesting. Um, the, the Java it, uh, program at, at issue is, is the APIs, right? So there are about 166 packages in, in the Java 2SC 5.0 uh, release, which was at issue here, OK? And a lot of those are sort of pre-written sort of shortcuts you may know of um, if, you're work, if you've worked with Java. And I don't know how many folks you've got here that do programming and stuff. I'm assuming there's quite a bit. So there's, you know, these are, these are shortcuts, people that want to actually program in Java. And 37 of those packages 
And just to kind of back up a little bit, a package, what, what's a package in Java? Well, a package is composed of classes, which are generally composed of, of methods, et cetera. So out of those 166, 37 were ones that Oracle claimed Google stole from, basically. And if you, if you know anything about Java, generally, the way these uh, the methods are written is you've got what what amounts to different you've got method headers which are basically sort of uh, elaborate names for those methods and then you've got the imp implementing code which actually does the work and actually uh, is the if you're looking to get a particular function done it's it's what does it for you and so at, at issue here was the declaring code which is the method headers um, and and Google had taken those method headers and they had rewritten the implementations for for their code in order to make Android work with um, people that were going to be used to programming in Java. If they were going to be calling the same types of methods, they could use those type of method headers in order to, to call and get similar things done in Android. And so they ended up taking about 7,000 lines of Oracle's code, or Sun's code, now Oracle's code, um, and that amounted to about 3% of the Java API total, total code. And Android itself has about 15,000 lines of, of code in it, so we're not talking a whole lot of code, but to Oracle it, it mattered. This, gets in, this, this slide here hopefully shows you a little bit more about uh, what we're talking about. We'll meet, for those of you that, that aren't that aren't Java programmers. Uh, I'm not a Java programmer. Uh, this tells you a little bit more about uh, what we mean by declaring code versus implementing code. Um, so if you look at the, r the red top three lines, um, those are generally the, de the declarations that will basically tell if you're, if you're writing a call to a, a method in Java, this will tell you basically where to go and it also will direct you uh, more or less the inputs you have to provide in order to get an output that doesn't have an error in it. Um, and so the, if, if you look up there, it's, it's the, red, the red section that, that Oracle was claiming that Google's, Google stole, and Google admitted to actually taking, taking these lines. There were some other things, uh, if you know anything about the case, there were some other things as well that were a couple other minor um, pieces that um, Google apparently took, a couple other um, uh, packages that uh, were in there, but they were they were very minor and ended up uh, not being a real not being the interesting legal issue and or really the interesting business issue in this case because uh, it wasn't going to get them a whole lot. Oracle wasn't going to get them a whole lot in terms of um, uh, what they really wanted to do, which was to to get you know get our friends at Google to buy a license or to or to pay them a bunch of money. So what what did the district court find? This is the district court in the Northern District of California, and as we said, the the jury found that there was infringement. In other words, they, they found that, yeah, Google pretty much took copyrightable material. They originally had a trial on fair use, but the jury couldn't decide. They, they were deadlocked on that issue. And then the court had a separate, um, made a separate decision. I have, just to kind of back up, the court <laughs> divided the trial up into phases. So they had a separate trial on infringement, they had a separate trial on fair use, and then they had uh, the, the court decided the issue of copyrightability. And so there, the, the court broke down the claims of Oracle into two different kinds. One was sort of a, a literal copying, in other words, taking the actual declaring code itself. But then the other piece of it was taking the structure, sequence, and organization of the Java APIs. And that ends up being the more interesting topic and it's the one that uh, gets uh, talked about the most. But at the heart of the, the issues in the case is, is something that's at the heart of copyright law, and that's the, the notion of the idea-expression dichotomy. So generally, copyright law is there to protect the expression of a particular work of authorship. It does not, it is, does not protect the ideas. So it, copyright uh, infringement is not the same as something like plagiarism, for example. And Section 102A of the Copyright Act sets forth the, 
type of subject matter that can get protection. So literary works and audio audiovisual works and that kind of stuff. And that's coupled with 102B. And what 102B says is that even if a work of authorship is original, we're still not going to give protection to the ideas, the processes, the methods, et cetera, that are in that work, regardless of how they might be embodied or, or described. And the, the reason for that is, of course, there are other means which the law decides they want to use to protect those types of subject matter. Patent law, for example, trade secret law, uh, and in other countries there, there are different neighboring rights that you can use to protect other things as well. And one of, one of the problems with this idea expression dichotomy is that oftentimes it's extremely hard to tell what's idea and what's expression. Sometimes it's pretty easy, but often it's hard. And so courts and um, other uh, government bodies have tried to come up with ways to think about this and to hash those issues out. Three of these are up here, and that's um, merger, uh, scenes of fair, and, and the titles and short phrases sort of doctrine. And the merger, the merger doctrine is this notion that if there's really only one or a couple ways to express something, then essentially the idea and the expression have basically merged, and you really can't, can't protect it. Um, the sense of fair doctrine is this notion that in some, in some works of authorship, there are just some stock elements that you're always going to see. So if you're making a movie about a Western, you're generally going to see guys riding horses, so horses, cowboy hats, you know, maybe a fort with some cavalry, that, that kind of stuff. And the fact that you've got elements like that that may be the same as someone else's work, it's, that's not going to be something that you can then claim copyright infringement for. Short phrases is a, is a notion that uh, it's, it's part of, say, the Copyright Office has a doctrine about that and courts have interpreted it. So generally, a, a title or a short phrase or something like that, a slogan, for example, is not going to be something that's subject to copyright. There may be other ways to protect that by a trademark or things like that, depending on how it's used, but it's, it's not going to be something that you can then go out and say someone's infringed your copyright on. So in the, the district court's analysis, it, it did two things. So first it talked about, well, let's talk about the literal copying of this code. And the court there said, well, the, if you go back and, and we think about sort of, I'll go back to this a little bit. So when you look at what these, what these words are here, you've got words that identify the package at the top. You've got words that identify the class. You've got public and static, which, which basically tells you from where you're coming from, basically. And then you've got some small words like INT, which might tell you that you have to input an integer or you're going to get an integer out, and the word max, meaning you're going to get the greater of two numbers. So what the, the, the court uh, said was, you know, well, most of those are really just short phrases, and we're not going to give copyright protection to, say, the phrase max or the, the word math or things like that. And furthermore, because this is really, this declaring code is something that identifies where to go, basically, and, and what to do, there's really no other way to write that and have the same function happen. So we're going to go ahead and say that, th that from a literal standpoint, it's merged. And there's no, there's no difference between the idea and the expression in reality there. So we're not going to give any kind of a literal <laughs> protection or protection to, to uh, this, this item, this declaring code, for purposes of literal copying. But then the more interesting issue, as I talked about before, was this issue of, you know, what about the non-literal copying? So in other words, a structure, sequence, and organization of a, of a program is similar to like the plot of a movie. And you can, or a plot of a book, for example. And you can, so you can infringe someone else's novel and you n not take a word from their novel as long as you're, you, know, you have the same characters drawn up, they do the, basically the same things, et cetera. And so the analog to that in the software world is, is SSO, or Structure, Sequence, and Organization. And here, what Oracle was trying to say was, you know, this declaring code, it, it looks pretty simple, but actually it reflects the way we've organized all, this, all, this, all the Java uh, packages that we've got out there. And if you take the declaring code, you're actually taking that organization and that's protectable, and therefore you've got a copyright infringement right there. Well, in this case, you know, the court again 
looked at what was being taken and it it looked at the declaring code and it and it basically said we understand that there may be some some structure and some organization here and it may even be original so one of the things about a copyright law is that if it's if it's really not original if there's sort of this notion that you're just kind of just it's using like a alphabetical list or something like that you may not have any particular organization that's original but here uh, there were options that a program could have used and the court said we understand that but nevertheless what it actually is doing is acting like a command system and a command system is basically a method for operating uh, Java and Java like programs and therefore it's really in that 102 B category of items that even if it's expressive it still is outside the scope of copyright the trick the tricky thing of course here is that the the words uh, in this case are actually what's kind of doing the work in the in the declare in both the declaring code and the, and the implementing code piece of it and so you can't have sort of one without the other as opposed to something like where you may be describing a system in a book where the system is sort of sitting outside of the of the actual text itself here the actual you know function is occurring with the text um, and so that's what the what the court decided that nevertheless it's gonna it's gonna think about that as a method of operation not gonna be protectable so then the federal circuit so why does it go to the federal circuit well I can just I'll just tell you quickly the the case comes out of the night of, of the Ninth Circuit District Court right but so normally we go to the Ninth Circuit but because you've got a patent infringement claim in that first round the Federal Circuit has jurisdiction over a patent claim so Oracle appears it appeals it to the Federal Circuit which depending on who you ask is generally maybe more conservative on issues of protection or maybe maybe say more protective of intellectual property rights so the Federal Circuit decision comes down and it's basically taking a way different way of thinking about this and it, it reverses the, the the district court on copyrightability and what it says is that there is no merger of the uh, declaring code in terms of literal copying and then it says that even though the SSO is a, is a method or system of operation it still is expressive and therefore it gets protection as a copyrightable subject matter the other thing it, it did was it sort of criticized the, the analysis or the way that the district court thought about, about these things in several ways. But one of the things that the district court was doing was thinking that what makes this declaring code special was the fact that it, it's designed for making code operate together. And so a lot of its analysis centered on how that affected the way you need to think about this code and its relationship to uh, things like the merger doctrine or or things like section 102b for example um, and the federal circuit said you really shouldn't be thinking about that at all there was a question as to whether this should even be coming into play in a copyrightability type analysis as opposed to coming in maybe later on in a infringement type analysis or a fair use type analysis for example um, and then of course it sent the the case back down as we said to the district court for fair use so so what about the declaring so as I said the the declaring code issue the 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 Federal Circuit said you know what the issue here is it's it's got short phrases and I'm sure but you know those phrases can be creative and and so their thinking was just because they're short phrases doesn't necessarily put them immediately outside of of copyrightability um, and the second thing they said was well you know the way that those are arranged in as part of the declaring code uh, that's creative and there are, there's more than one way for a programmer who's writing that initially to do it and you need to look what their point was you need to look at who's writing it who, the the author as opposed to the copier and in terms of thinking about whether or not something is merged the fact that it's become that job has become you know widespread for example shouldn't come into play in terms of whether or not you've got uh, a merger that then makes something not copyrightable and that's um, I mean, just sort of re re that what they basically said was you know like Google could have written its own declaring code if they wanted to now it wouldn't have worked it would have made it would have made it difficult for then people coming to Android to understand you know how to write because they would have to then learn a whole new set of declarations in order to do it in order to, to invoke these uh, packages that are sort of shortcuts right but 
the federal circuit was basically saying, you know, too bad. Um, and then they moved on to the um, structure sequence and, sequence and organization argument. And there what they basically said was, you know, 102B is not intended to be a, an absolute. And what 102B is intended to do is sort of is sort of clarify the idea expression dichotomy and talk about those things that are going to be on the outside. But you, in order to do the analysis, you have to think about that SSO and think about whether it, it, it it's creative or not. And if it's if it's creative and if it's expressive, then you don't have to really go to that 102B analysis because it could be a, a system, a method of operation, but it could be expressive and therefore copyrightable. And in this in this case. You know, they said that, you know, the district court had found that it was expressive and it was creative, but they had said it was automatically in, in 102B, and the, the Federal Circuit said, well, you know, that's really not how you need to think about it. You need to go ahead and do the analysis of copyrightability based upon the, the item itself and not whether or not it falls into a, a, a one of these kind of categories because there could be elements that we're talking about that are expressive if there's more than one way to do something. And, and here there was more than one way to write the declaring code. Um, and what's interesting is that the, um, the way that the Federal Circuit seemed to be thinking about Java and Java programming is really in, in a very traditional sense of, of how computer programs works. In other words, they're looking at computer programs as a whole, almost as a whole, and thinking about them uh, in terms of literary works, such that as long as there's a different way to, to put something in different words, then it doesn't really matter whether or not something is, is, a, is a functional item. And so it becomes difficult there to, uh, when you think that through, it becomes difficult to think of, well, what, what aspects of a program that really matter are ones that you can't express in a different way? And so if you look at sort of the differences up here, the way they thought about it versus the way the district court was thinking about it, the district court was really thinking about uh, computer programs, at least these days, as being much more heterogeneous, let's say, than uh, at least in terms for in terms of copyrightability. And what was interesting here is that if you if you have been following this case at all, you know that um, Judge Alsop, who is a district court judge in this case, he actually bothered to learn Java in order to to write his opinion and to understand the case better. And about, I would say you know, a good third of the case, of, a third of the opinion anyway, is actually taken up by uh, his explanation about how Java works and or how he understands Java to work. And so, so if you look at, at his, his thinking here, um, he was really focusing on what he perceived Oracle to be claiming was the infringement, and that was the, the structure of those APIs as expressed in, in those words. And so he was looking at that as as the only thing that that really sort of mattered for, for purposes of the analysis, and that being different than the implement the implementations that were going on, and if you look at that, his conclusion was, you know, that piece of it is is a command structure, and so it has a different. It's playing a different role, basically. It's it's by definition playing a role of it letting people write commands to this particular uh, to a particular Android program, for example. And, and so that's where sort of interoperability sort of, I, when you think about it, comes into the analysis. As I say, the Federal Circuit thought it played no role, basically, in issues of copyrightability. And in fact, it's talking about the fact that, you know, when we're talking about interoperability, the only way it comes into play is when you're thinking about the author's choices that they're making in terms of the writing of the program. And in this case, you need to be looking at what Oracle's doing and in Oracle's case, they had options, and they were not constrained by compatibility issues, and therefore, there's nothing else that needs to be thought about. And the district court had a had a had a different view of it. Uh, you know, they were thinking that you know it, it 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 comes into play because the whole reason for this declaring code, for example, is to act as a set of commands to allow interoperability. Um, and it. it just wanted to say one thing. It, when we're talking about interoperability, what we're really talking about, in, in this case anyway, I mean, there's different kinds of interoperability. There's, there's sort of connectability where you've got um, one product trying to connect to another one. In this case, we're sort of talking about in the interchangeability of, of Android and Java, at least in terms of um, 
people being able to write similar programs to, to fit, fit with both. And the fact that there had been several, you know, many programs that had been written in Java by the time that Android was really out and, and out there. So, so there's that clash going on, and, and of course the Federal Circuit uh, trumps, and they, and they send the case back down to the district court, who then has a fair use analysis. And so fair use is a, a defense to infringement. And if, if you have uh, in, uh, copyright infringement, but there are certain circumstances uh, that allow you to maintain your infringing use because there's a, a policy reason for it, there's, there's a public good. And, it, it, and if you think about it, it's sort of the way that the, say the First Amendment in this country and copyright reconcile each other. Um, so there's, there are several factors that courts take into account when they think about fair use. Actually, there's four of them. They're not particularly uh, clear, even though they're in the statute. But they're ones that you're gonna, if you if you you're gonna read, you know, I guess opinions, or if you just, if you read about uh, the way fair use is kind of works, it's difficult to sort of from case to case try to figure out exactly w where the consistencies are all the time. They're they're not. It's not often t easy to tell. But these are the four uh, the four factors, and in this case. Um, the jury found for for Google, but the what, we, what you get out of a jury is just basically you know we, we find we find for the defendant Google. Uh, in this case, we, we get a little bit more because the district court um, had had to write an opinion d denying some motions for um, uh, for re I think a retrial, I think, or maybe it was for um, judgment as a matter of law. So they actually went through the fair use analysis, and Judge Alsop did, and talked about. What, what his opinion was in terms of what the jury could have found. So it's pretty instructive in terms of, uh, A, reiterating some of the issues that were in the case, and also m giving some rationale for maybe why Google prevailed here. Um, and so let's talk about the, the purpose and character of the use. So this is where you get into uh, several different things, uh, including whether or not the use is commercial, whether or not it's transformative. In this case, uh, the court Judge Alsop said, you know what, it's, it's pretty obvious that the jury could have found that even though, in this case, Android is, is a commercial product and commercial, commercial uh, products or commercial uh, in uses of, a, of an item generally tend to get um, hammered in the, in the fair use analysis because you're making money off someone else's stuff, et cetera, so it's not fair. But it's not, not dispositive. There are, there are ways you can use something in a commercial way and, and still fair use. And in this case, um, the the court said, well, you know what, that's true, but there were non-commercial uses of Android, and Android is available for, for free. It's under an Apache license, et cetera, so there's some public good uh, there. And then in terms of the transform transformational use of Android, well, I mean, they rewrote all the implementations. So um, they certainly transformed. It wasn't like they just um, pulled all 166 packages of, of these Java APIs and just um, plucked them and put them right in. The nature of the work, um, fictional works tend to get uh, higher protection in terms of fair use because um, they tend to be thought of as more creative, for example. Um, and of course here we've got, uh, at least in, in Judge Alsop's opinion, we've got a high degree of functionality um, going on, especially in what was taken. And so the jury could have easily found that things were pretty functional and therefore it really didn't deserve um, a whole lot of um, this this consideration really deserved to go uh, Google's way the amount of taking uh, we kind of talked about that or mentioned at the beginning um, you know and this was something that um, probably played into um, the uh, jury's decision I mean we've got three percent of code that's actually taken as opposed to the 97 percent that Google rewrote themselves and then the, the, the effect on the market. Um, this is probably the most interesting one. Um, so this is, this is a factor that gets into whether or not the infringing work is sort of taking the place in the marketplace of the, of the work which, uh, which is being infringed. And, and the more that it actually affects the, the value of the infringed work, um, the less likely the use is going to be fair. So in this case, what ends up happening is that even though Android is, is kind of all over the place by this time, I mean we're talking, you know, this is well, this fair use trial was this this past uh, May. Uh, it's all over the place. You've got Android Wear, Android TV, um, you've got Android everywhere. 
in this case, the, 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 the fair use trial really centered only on the mobile market and the laptop market. And Google was able to uh, present a lot of evidence that they really hadn't harmed Android, uh, hadn't harmed Java in desktop and laptop and there really was no market for Java in the mobile market. Um, there actually was a, a, a Java product for mobile, Java ME, but uh, it, it never took off, and, and that was sort of part of the reason why, um, uh, part of the reason why Oracle and Google were even negotiating in the first place, because Oracle was looking for a way to get in. So, so in this case, you know, the jury could have easily found that there was no harm in the, in the mobile market, or not much harm in the mobile market, and therefore the use was was pretty fair. So then that that should be the end uh, normally, right? But um, these guys have been slugging it out for um, you know several years, and things have have gotten um, pretty nasty. I mean, there were just I think a couple weeks ago there was I was reading a news story where uh, there's a um, I forget the name of the, the group in in D.C. that's a, a anti -Google, Google watchdog group. That it's come out that Oracle's funding um, part of that apparently. Um, so, so they're they're still they're not happy with each other, or at least Oracle's especially not happy. So, um, Oracle is now threatening to move for a new trial on the fair use issue because, and this has just come out as well. At the same time that that Google was arguing that it really didn't have a play in the laptop space. Um, it turns out that at the pretty much the same time, it's announcing Google Play for Chrome, which is its laptop, its Android laptop uh, platform. And so Oracle's claiming this is bad faith, fraud on the court, and this was never brought up, et cetera, et cetera. And what's well, Google saying, well, you know, we had something that was similar that we had told you about a while ago, and that's Arc. And Arc is their previous Android, I guess, for um, for laptops, which hasn't done very well. And so they basically scrapped it, and then they put together Google Play for for Chrome, which is basically totally rewritten. And so they're saying, well, we, we know we told you about it. You guys didn't, you didn't decide not to bring it up. And Oracle saying, oh no, this is a totally different deal. And um, and so things have have heated back up again. Um, as I say. The, the one of the issues was they, they agreed to, to limit some of that fair the fair use conversation to to basically the um, Android for mobile and and they basically uh, both both parties have basically uh, agreed more or less that you know there could be other trials for the other implementations of, of Android so it, it whether Google uh, whether Oracle has the stomach to, to go through more of that uh, and whether you know Google does as well but they, there could be other trials because there are other other sub implementations uh, and then the final quote here I've just got is from Judge Alsop who is um, clearly sort of like the the, the dad at the end of the trip um, with the kids in the car who are now wanting to you know stop at the candy store or something and and so he's he basically saying you know there's do you know how many social security claimants I can't rule on right now because you're arguing over a cost bill they're, they're still going back and forth over you know you owe me you owe me court costs for this and and uh, and and so there's there's still a lot of mudslinging that's going on but um, so that's kind of where we are where we are now and it, you know it's it, so it's sort of who knows whether or not there's going to be another set of of litigation based on um, whether or not Oracle thinks it can get more money out of Google, seeing as how it's got a favorable, f you know, federal circuit decision, but the fair use still is still up in the air. Um, as I say, the first fair use trial hung, so it's not like a jury couldn't find the other direction. But um, but right now, uh, they're uh, they're they're pushing to see. I think or I think Google's kind of licking its wounds a little bit and then looking to see where where it can go. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of a summary of kind of where things are. I mean, that's kind of a lot of information, but it it makes sense to sort of go over it to then see what you guys want to talk about um, in relation to to this stuff. And I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah. So um, I'll keep my comments relatively brief. Um, so I come at this from a policy angle. Uh, I'm an attorney with public knowledge. We do a lot of uh, consumer advocacy uh, in digital rights in Washington D.C. Um, and I'm going to do my best to channel my colleague, Charles Dwan, who's been our uh, amicus writing machine on this case. Um, I highly encourage everyone, if you're interested in this, to go and Google Charles Dwan uh, Slate Klingon. He had an interesting article up in Slate back in May of last year, um, which talked about some of the policy implications of this. Um, and to sort of back up a little bit, I think 
you know, one of the, the really what sort of what James pointed out when he was talking about um, concepts of merger uh, and the idea expression dichotomy is this really gets at the core of how many ways can you possibly say the same idea? Um, what is, by extension, a language? A language is fundamentally a series of phonemes or letters that you use to express a given idea. Um, you can you you can make up your own language. You can use Dothraki to tell your kid to go to his room. You can say it in Klingon if you want to scar him for life, um, or you could just say it in English. Uh, having said that, if you use a if you tell your kid to go to their room in Spanish and your child does not speak Spanish, it's not going to do a lot for you. Um, so really this gets at the idea of how many ways can you possibly come up with to say the exact same thing and how many of those ways are actually going to be useful in the situations that you're trying to use it. Um, and so one of the things that we've been playing around with in the office, because we're a bunch of giant nerds, um, is this idea of could this possibly be extrapolated by the logic of the federal circuit into copywriting things like constructed languages, um, even up to including things like Esperanto or Dothraki or, uh, you know, any of Tolkien's elvish languages, though, depending on when he died, I don't remember off the top of my head, but that may be a sort of statute of limitations thing for him. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a really difficult problem to suss out. Um, this idea of not only how do you, how many ways can you say the same thing, but this idea, and this comes up a lot in uh, copyright in other areas, uh, especially in visual and expressive arts, which is a lot of times you'll have something that is partially expressive and partially functional. So if you've got a table lamp, you can get the lamp from Ikea, which is 20 bucks. It's a, you know, a, a metal pole with a light bulb on top of it in a shade. That's about as functional as you can get. You turn it on, it'll provide you light. Then you can have your grandmother's end table lamp, which has cherubs winding up it in seashells or whatever, and it will provide light, but mostly it's an art piece. And the question is, if you can't copyright a functional object, which copyright law traditionally says you cannot, um, that usually falls under the idea of like design patents, so we have a system for dealing with that. But when you've got something that is both functional and expressive, how do you suss out the difference between those two parts? It's a really difficult question. It's one that's ongoing in a lot of different um, areas right now. Uh, if it's something that interests you, I'm actually on a panel tomorrow about um, the legality of cosplay and fan fiction, and there's a case at the Supreme Court right now about uh, costuming, well, specifically about cheerleader uniforms, but uh, <laughs> it, it ends up having a lot of implications mm -hmm. for cosplay and costuming. Um, so I highly recommend, come check that out, 11.30 tomorrow, self-promotion self here. Um, but yeah, this is, so this is a question that comes up over and over again, and software, which is by its nature designed to be a functional thing. It is designed to give you a language that, it's, it's programming language. I mean, we call it what it is. You, it gives you words to give to a computer that then will output certain sets of results. Uh, in a relatively predictable way, and really in a way that is optimized to be easy to learn if you already know an entry-level coding language. So, you know, like I said, this raises a lot of different issues. Um, software is really the frontier of where these, these ideas start to clash. Um, partly because it's a relatively young field with copyright. You know, we've only really been dealing with these things since, I don't know, the, my case was the early 80s. Um, and people are still getting a handle on it. And, you know, not a lot of people are coders in the government or in the courts. And so you have to work by analogy. And there are people in Washington, D.C. will get into knockdown, drag out fights about what the right analogy is for some of these things, um, leading to sometimes very interesting results in a courtroom. Uh, the fair use portion of this case actually got a little colorful. Uh, someone dragged in a full-size filing cabinet filled with files and opened it up and tried to say that the uh, the SSO was basically like the system of tabs on the inside of the filing cabinet, but they like brought it in on a dolly. It was like a full filing cabinet loaded with stuff. Um, this is a very dramatic courtroom moment. So uh, yeah, those are my sort of general, that's the angle I'm coming at it from. Um, you know, obviously I haven't been following this as closely as James has, but I'm um, happy to field any questions you might have either about the case specifically or the larger policy implications. From the way you described, I don't know, from the way it was described, um, it appears that these rulings that from the circuit court are a complete body slam on interoperability as even a consideration in these, in these kinds of cases. Uh, is there anything left for that? Um, my understanding is that it was reinforced in the DMCA as a reasonable exception for fair use purposes, and I'm concerned about it as a long-term issue. 
So it's interesting you actually bring up the DMCA, and I'll address that because that's something I deal with a lot um, in my job, which is essentially that the DMCA, the way you have exceptions made to the DMCA, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for um, non-super copyright wonks in the room, uh, is basically every three years you have to have a hearing at the Copyright Office, and then essentially the way the law is written, those exceptions expire at the end of three years, and then you have to argue for them all over again for another three-year cycle. So in theory, at any point, if someone doesn't show up and do their job every three years at the Copyright Office, you could lose the interoperability um, exception. So that is a possibility with un under the law. Um, you know, the other thing that I think a lot of people look at is, you know, James mentioned that the Federal Circuit has a reputation, um, which people on my side of the aisle say is very deserved for being extremely protectionist uh, in how they look at software, because they normally come at it from a patent angle. Um, other courts, not as much, especially when you're dealing with the Ninth Circuit, which if you were Oracle, you would very quickly want to get out of the Ninth Circuit, because um, you don't want to deal with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which tends to have a little bit more wiggle room on copyright, um, and a lot more experience dealing with it with Hollywood and, and California and a lot of the content industries out there. Um, so there can very easily be a circuit split, basically, if this comes up again. Um, no one is necessarily, I hate my lawyer brain is kicking me for saying this, but it, n district courts, because the federal circuit doesn't actually have like locational courts that are technically under its mandate. It's just kind of a standalone entity. Theoretically, this could get litigated again somewhere and come out with a different result in a circuit court, at which point you'd have to go to the Supreme Court. So there's some strategic considerations in there. I don't know of any other cases in the hopper other than this one, which will realistically probably be going on for another couple of years. But hmm. yeah, and to sort of get to answer your question, I mean, it's it's uh, hard to say if, say if it's really a body slam or not because I think the problem was it really got it's and it's not really resolved yet but it it's it's resolution played out through through fair use and and you know fair use is just one of those things where it's hard to really predict the outcome you're going to get as it's, you know the the first jury deadlocked on it the second jury found for Google you could see a, a third jury you know finding for Oracle depending upon how those factors play out. And the thing about fair use, right, is that um, you're at another stage of the trial. You're 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 a lot you're you're deep, digging a lot deeper into your pocketbook at that point. Now, if you're Google, you can do that, right, against Oracle. But how many other people can do that against an Oracle, right? I mean, you're just not you're going to get buried for the most part. So um, so the problem is that you know by not having a sort of a, a more of a bright line rule, um, you're you know. The, you're not necessarily going to lose, right? But you're going to have to go through a, a little more pain, probably. Um, but also, sort of to, to reinforce, it's it's not so much a body slam because because it went through the federal circuit and it came up through the ninth circuit. The the case doesn't have the same precedential value it might have if it came up if it get, came up just to, came, went to the ninth circuit, for example, because. The only value of the case now, as I understand it, is if another case comes up through the Ninth Circuit to the Federal Circuit, mm -hmm. then the Federal Circuit it was going to apply that same law. The Ninth Circuit has to apply that law, but it doesn't. It's not going to apply in any of the other circuits that are out there necessarily. Now, there, I say that um, necessarily because I mean this case has gotten a lot of attention. It's gotten a lot of consideration. There's probably going to be a lot of law review articles and whatnot written about it. So the next time it comes up, it's going to get cited. And it has, I know there's another case um, that's been around around the same time, which is um, SAS versus WPL, which had to do uh, actually with a language and someone taking, uh, violating a license and learning about something and doing basically a similar kind of thing. And this case has been cited in that, although it's so different that it actually didn't end up mattering too much but so it's gonna it's gonna be out it's gonna be haunting things I think but uh, I don't think it's gonna be I think it's I think it's still I think there's a lot here that is left open that um, other courts are gonna be able to play with and I think the fact that the district court uh, took the amount of effort that they took to understand Java and understand the software world and to make the point that you know the way software works has changed so much in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, when when a lot of the 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 cases that the Federal Circuit was citing were were out there, we're you know we're talking you know in the 90s and and before that, and and even though uh, you know object-oriented languages and things like that have been around for a while, um, the the amount of interchangeability and connectability between programs has just with with the web it's just you know it's just probably exponentially different and so thinking about 
software has to probably has to change a little bit. I think that's what uh, the district court was acknowledging was that we need to think about software not as uh, like a single literary work like a book because it really isn't like that. There are, there are different things that are going on in software and so it makes sense to think about those things maybe even in different ways. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that people are going to, I think, find pretty persuasive when they, when they start coming to this case, probably more so than, than what the Federal Circuit has said even though it's the Federal Circuit. So that's just my, my two cents. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I represent people that are trying to, trying to do things like this, trying to write programs. And so when they're trying to figure out, you know, what, what can I do when I'm, when I'm trying to interoperate with some other product, um, you know, other than saying, telling them to get a license, which is you know, what you always tell them to do, right? Um, it's, it gets, it's hard because you're, now you're having to think, well, I, I, you can't necessarily take what, you, what most programmers think they can take, which is the declarations and use them. They have to think about, well, am I using, what, how am I using them and things like that, um, which is a, a more difficult analysis to do, I think, when you're trying to program, so. Does anyone have any other questions? Got a couple. So this is kind of a question for just Oracle's, I guess, business practice, just kind of the way I've noticed them handling things. Um, I work for a company that's a reseller of their software they just purchased, Micros, a point of sale. Uh, company, and I've noticed that they are have become very aggressive in terms of trying to squeeze out as every dollar that they can. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they've um, even companies that say they let their support for the software through us lapse for a month. They want them to completely repurchase the software, so tens of thousands of dollars, which they already have. They're just trying to get support for. So. Um, I know opinion is kind of a thing you try to kind of steer away from a little bit with things like this, but I guess my question is just how you think Oracle is acting. They seem to be very aggressive in their acquisitions of companies and then trying to get as much as they can very quickly out of it. So I don't steer away from opinion because I'm a policy advocate. Um, <laughs> this is my job and you will not find any kind words for Oracle out of me. Um, <laughs> also because you know Oracle has, um, I think the polite way that uh, a lot of policy people tend to refer to them in patent infringement cases is a repeat player. Um, they're, they can be patent trolls, like, let's be honest about it. Um, and yeah, I think one of the more interesting parts of this case is that Oracle, when Oracle and Sun were negotiating, um, you know, things didn't end up working out, but Sun was actually, um, I guess it had been actually relatively supportive um, of Google's attempt to uh, basically Google re-implementing Java um, or par parts of Java. And then Oracle came in and as soon as they didn't get the license deal they wanted, they filed suit. So, you know, it's, it's sort of the um, software legal battle equivalent of a telenovela at this point, um, complete with name calling in the courtroom. And I think at one point the judge asked one of the attorneys if he'd ever actually called the other attorney an asshole to his face. It got, it got pretty ridiculous. If you follow Sarah Jung, who, um, I don't remember who she writes for, but she was, she was live tweeting that from inside the courtroom. It was probably the best string of tweets I've ever followed in a day. Um, so I highly recommend looking those up. But. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't have any firsthand um, experience of what you're talking about, but I have um, I have plenty of secondhand experience, and and that seems to be what's going on, sort of the mo that's going on with, or with Oracle right now. Um, and uh, I can s without so my wife's also an attorney, and and she's a litigator, and and she's the one that's kind of bumped up against. Um, Oracle that they, they look to be doing a lot of digging around and they're, they're looking for to find to find money um, right now a little bit and uh, you know because I, I think some of their other um, avenues haven't been going like they've expected so they're they're looking for money in, in some places so um, it's one you get that from time to time in the tech industry where you've got a um, a, a particular player who um, things aren't going the way they thought in, in one way and so they're, they're looking to, to monetize some other things and, and sometimes litigation is the way they, they choose to go. And so, um, you know, but, that word, but word gets around. I mean, like, you're not the only person who I've heard that from and, and you know, as a long-term strategy, it, it's probably not a great one. Um, so, uh, it, you know, but as, as I say, I mean, you can tell by the way that they're behaving in this case that they, they feel very hard done by and they feel that this is a way they can make some money in the mobile space because they can't do it themselves and um, you know it's probably not going to end well um, but uh, but you know I, I, far be it for me to uh, to tell Oracle how to do how to run its business but it you know I, I have not heard I have not heard things that are different from what you've said so 
Any other? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, the most similar case that I remember uh, to this at, uh, was the SCO versus IBM case, which uh, I know that that case covered a lot of ground, but I think one of the things it covered was uh, some of the, uh, the, c uh, the headers that are part of traditional Unix, uh, um, uh, traditional Unix APIs. And unless, uh, unless I'm confused about what level th uh, that uh, court case happened at, it felt like that kind of decided uh, this issue. So why, uh, un unless I'm, what am I not understanding uh, about that, uh, about the relevancy of that case to this case, uh, or does uh, do very similar cases just seem to uh, keep occurring in our legal system? Uh, without without like precedents really uh, effectively deciding them. So I don't think that went to the Supreme Court. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with it, but I feel like that would have. This is my huge. <laughs> this is like the least lawyerly thing I could say. I don't know, but I feel like I would have heard of it if it had gone to the Supreme Court. Um, yeah, I don't think it. I don't think it did. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't think it was a. I don't think it was settled on copyright. I don't think it was. It didn't have the same copyrightability um, issues. It, it had copyrightability issues in it. It had a lot of patent issues in it, um, but it didn't. It it and even if it even if it had been decided, if it hadn't gone to the Supreme Court, it wouldn't be precedent for this case anyway, because this came out. I mean, SCO that was not the Ninth Circuit. I, I don't believe. I think it was. Um, I forget. Maybe Second Circuit or something. But um, but anyway, no. It 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 didn't play in and certainly did not, not play into the court's analysis here at all. So um, so is that is that, that case relatively recent that you mentioned? It's several years old, right? It's. More okay, my, my legal assistant, a.k.a. my husband in the back with an iPhone, um, <laughs> just buzzed me. <laughs> He's sitting there. Everyone embarrass him. Um, so apparently, that's still in district. That is either remanded or still puttering around in the district court in Utah somewhere. It's, that's not uncommon for these cases to go on for extended periods of time. So um, that wouldn't surprise me if it's still puttering around at the district level. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, it did. <coughs> it so, did. Um, did this matter about uh, creativity that the federal court brought up um, versus like the social good uh, consideration? I, I could see a situation where there are a finite number of optimal and secure ways to do a given thing in software. <coughs> and you were talking about, you know, there's only so many ways to say a thing. Are are they ever considering from a social good perspective that to meet this benchmark of creativity in your code, you would have to write some really suboptimal, full of holes sort of program that by and large, you know, could could put all of our data in danger at some point, theoretically? Um, I don't think I've heard it considered from that particular angle that the idea that you'd have to come up with a new coding language functionally or a new set of calls would lead to suboptimal code and sort of the repercussions of that. Um, so one of the things that a sort of as a as a public interest advocate I feel like the the social copyright law is not necessarily founded on the social good <laughs> um, and that can be exceptionally frustrating despite the fact that the actual copyright clause in the Constitution says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts shall secure to the creators for a limited time, yada, yada, yada. Um, so theoretically, it's supposed to be for the public good. Um, it really, I think, I mean, most of the time that comes into what James was mentioning about um, like merger and sense of fair and these ideas, which, which are all kind of different angles at getting at the idea that you can't expect someone to reinvent the wheel every time they have to use it, so. Yeah, I think that's right. So I mean, um, Copyright law really is sort of agnostic as between good and bad, you know, and, uh, with with respect to the um, the code that or any kind of thing that's written. Um, and and I think the issue that you're sort of getting at is, well, you know, should should that be taken into account when you're thinking about copyrightability um, for purposes of um, you know the way something is written? If it's written in a way that is uh, that serves a public good that, that that's secure or something like that, should it get maybe lesser protection from a copyrightability standpoint? Um, because it's the best way to write something, and therefore, you should be you should be free to to replicate th those types of items in order to maintain that sort of public good. Um, and I think you know that's sort of what is 
dividing, I think, to a certain extent, the way the district court is thinking about things and the way the federal circuit is, was thinking about things. The federal circuit said it didn't care. In other words, you, you, should, you, should, you should not care about whether or not something has been widely adopted. You should not care about whether the people who actually wrote it were intending it to be a structure for making it easy for people to adopt. Um, it's, it's something that um, shouldn't, internet, whereas the district court was saying, you know, the fact that it's written, it's, it's written as a tool to be used by people so that it makes everything, everybody's life easier and therefore you should be free to copy it. Everybody should be free to copy it and it shouldn't be copyrightable because it's basically a, you know, it's a command system. It's, it's, a, it's a system of operation. Um, that's kind of where that kind of comes into play, but it's, it's not so much a whether or not it's a, um, good or bad in itself. It's whether or not the, the thing is, is, is at its heart uh, a functional thing or at, or at its heart an expressive thing. And, and um, as I say, part of the issue is that part of the problem here is that when you've got what you have is software, and software is, a t software is, is tools. But the problem is these tools are made out of language, right? And so historically, language gets, um, gets protection as a literary work. But in this case, you, you've got to, it's, 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 not really like a, it's not really like a novel. I mean, there's, there's been a lot, as, as Meredith was saying, I mean, there's, there's analogies that have been going back and forth all over um, throughout the, the various levels. Um, and there's uh, analogies to, to novels, there's analogies to libraries, there's analogies to file cabinets, et cetera. And, and you know, the Federal Circuit more or less bought Oracle's analogy that this was really more like a, like a book. And, and so therefore, if you take the little titles in a book, you take the words in a book, you know, you're, you're basically copying, copying things out of a literary work, and that's how they tended to treat this. Um, I do love the idea as sort of a philosophy mind bender, could you copyright the platonic form of software coding? Like if someone stumbled across upon the perfect software coding language, and that's everyone else, just go home, we figured it out. Could you copyright that? Um, right. I, I don't know, that's well, my... And, and philosophy I think, side talking you know, the problem is that you know Oracle conceded that they, they couldn't really protect Java itself but they wanted to protect these API's which are sort of in a way tools to use Java so it's it's um, you know it gets sort of like the issue of you know, wh where does the language stop and the sort of idioms that you create is kind of start and and the Federal Circuit bought into the notion that these were sort of protectable little idioms that were created using Java and the district court really thought, you know, this is really basically part of the language. It's just um, shortcuts within the language that you're sort of making. Um, so it's it definitely, it's, it was sort of a, when you think about it, sort of a battle over metaphors uh, between the two courts. I think, I guess we're short up on time, so we should probably, oh, we still have time? One last question. One last question? Uh, one more. I'm going to be hanging out here afterwards, so to the extent that I could answer anything, I'll Sir. be here. <laughs> Sir. The box. Oh. <laughs> It's like a blood we're sport here asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> Think fast. Uh, so where does that leave somebody who wants to walk out of here and develop a product in Java? Are we are we beyond all that squabbling or is it gonna come back and haunt us and we're gonna get a bill in the mail? Well I can I can tell you that it's if you're talking about just writing a uh, an app in Java, I mean Right now, I mean, you can get like Java is like Open JDK, I think now. So you can you just use like the open source license. That wasn't available to well. Google didn't want to do that because Android is not. Uh, they don't want to have to pass the compatibility tests. You know, with Java because Android's not really fully compatible with Java, and so they didn't they couldn't use well they didn't they didn't want to use the GPL because they, they you know they wanted to make Java available via Apache or whatever, so they couldn't do that. This, there was a specification license. They couldn't do that because it required compatibility, or they could get a commercial license from Oracle, which they or Sun, which they tried to do, and that that sort of broke down. So, if you're just simply writing apps, you should be able to use an open source way to do that. And in other words, you shouldn't have to worry about Oracle coming after you if you're doing that. If you're trying to re-implement Java in the same way that, that Google's doing, I, I'd probably think think twice about doing that. <laughs> Good luck and Godspeed. <laughs> Well, as long as you're following the um, the license that you've got from from Oracle, yeah, yeah. Which I mean, normally it's it's going to be. If, I think there's a pretty pretty permissive open source. It's like a GPL with class path exception or something now. So it's pretty permissive. Um, 
so it shouldn't be a problem. But uh, but yeah, this but is other, the lawyer side is read the contract. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we I mean, don't, but you should. I, I, you know, <laughs> if you're talking about online, I mean, pretty much nobody reads those online contracts. But if, but you <laughs> definitely should if you're talking about you know G, uh, GPL type license from or a specification license from Oracle. But you sh you shouldn't have the same unless you're trying to do a, a project like. Uh, like our friends at or that our friends at Google were trying to do, you shouldn't have the same type of issue. Um, <laughs> but w thanks for the question. Then. That's a good one. Great. Yeah. Thanks for coming for coming out. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.